Greetings in the name of the Almighty Son, Yeshua, who has been rescuing us by his loving kindness. I'm Daniel Gregg. I'm going to get into a famously off-quoted passage today, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, from the Messianic point of view. But first, let me provide you with some context and background. A small but growing number of formerly traditional Christians are making a change. They are starting to keep the law, the Torah. They are we. We are known as Messianics. But apologists of tradition do not like us. They hate Torah observance. They are confessed Torah deniers. Torah deniers frequently attack messianic practices by quoting their own translations of the Bible. Their own translations of the Bible. Don't expect them to accept a corrected version. Messianics spend a huge amount of time in apologetical defenses against anti-law attacks. Many Messianics, however, are undiscerning of the biased translations used against them. Understandably, Messianics have no choice but to use translations of anti-Torah apologists, but it is unwise to invest authority in these translations. Where they count the most, the translators have added their false doctrines to the text. To use their versions is like code pleading. Code pleading means when a text is against you, you ignore it, and you counter it with other texts that agree with you. This way you convince people to listen to your text. But what about the text you ignored? That's the problem with code pleading. After all, scripture is supposed to agree with itself. Chances are, the anti tor apologist has sophisticated theological rationalizing to make pro torah texts fit with their anti torah proof texts so they can get an anti torah result ultimately messianics are going to have to get rid of their proof texts legitimately using a corrected translation then the collapse of the anti-Torah system can be realized in all of its totality. There are some messianic versions, like David Stern's Jewish New Testament, but accepting Torah for oneself is not enough to be able to unravel centuries of false interpretation and translation. This is the legacy of lawlessness. Most of these versions deal with superficial things, like the pronunciations of words in Hebrew, or in Stern's case, even Yiddish. And most Messianic scholars, even though they observe Torah, are still mentally trapped in the matrix of corrupted theology, even more so than the non-scholar or non-intellectual. David Stern certainly was still trapped in what we call Reformed theology. The fact is, it is easier to learn new than to undo lies and relearn. Stern made a little progress, but his legacy contaminated his efforts. That's the sad fact. Even I struggle with the legacy matrix and have found myself going back over things to eliminate newly discovered theological errors from my past. Torah observance is not enough to be able to reverse the damage. It is only the minimum prerequisite. I never realized how hard and how long the path to repairing the damage would be. I set my heart to understand almost 40 years ago. I was barely out of high school. I spent 20 years repairing biblical chronology. I spent another 20 or more discovering what was wrong with theology and its impact on translations. In the year I was introduced to the Sabbath, the Most High dealt with my Calvinist upbringing. Ten years later, I was beginning to understand the problem with the translations, but was still caught in the believe-only trap. Twenty years later, I had enough Hebrew and Greek to solve the problem. And twenty-five years later, after torturous self-discipline in logical thinking and turning over every stone, the Spirit showed me the key answers. It took another fifteen years 
to produce the good news of Messiah. There is no doubt some room for improvements, but the foundations have been laid, the building has been built, and the improvements are mostly trim work. Most Messianics are going to find the good news of Messiah radically different than their traditional versions, and those with an ear to the Spirit will welcome this fresh development as an important work of necessary restoration. So without further ado, let us focus on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This is a classic text, both mistranslated and misunderstood, through a theological grid of Augustine and Calvin. The true good news will emerge from this text when we sweep away that theology and repair the translation. We will be required to understand a bit of Judaism's theology. Also, to figure out what Paul was combating, which is not what Torah deniers think he was combating. Here is the good news of Messiah. If I can zoom here, we can read the text. Because by loving kindness you have been getting rescued, yes you are, through faithfulness. And this getting rescued is not from you, from the Almighty it is a gift, not from works, so that a man will not have made himself to be boasting. And I can throw in verse 10 also. Yea, his work we are, being created by the anointed Yeshua, for good works, which the Almighty made ready beforehand, so that in them we will have walked. And here is my grandfather's Schofield Reference Bible. Let's zoom in on this one. For by grace are ye saved, through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Schofield's teacher was Louis Sperry Schaefer, a dispensationalist theologian who married Calvinism to an anti-law gospel. These two men had a profound impact on fundamentalist American Christianity. I have placed the two texts top and bottom here so we can compare and discuss them. The most important difference is faithfulness versus faith. The second most important difference is the italic clarification, this getting rescued. I explain in footnote 28 fee, that's there, why the word this refers to getting rescued. Or perhaps both, loving kindness and getting rescued. The word refers to getting rescued. The word this refers back to getting rescued and not the word faithfulness. The next most important consideration is the tense of the phrase have been getting rescued. Yes you are. This is a perfect participle augmented by a present tense helping verb in Greek. Typically, translators think they have to choose between using the present tense and a perfect when translating the Greek perfect. The reason they think this is a historical saga motivated by a theology of avoiding unwanted conclusions. They want us to think that salvation is 100% completed. And so some versions put, have been saved, like the ESV, or others, like the King James, put, are saved, and hope that we think it is a status. But the truth is that the tense is a present progressive perfect, have been getting rescued.
I tacked on yes you are to represent the further emphasis of the present tense helping verb. Notice the yes is an italic. Very subtle italics. That means the word is interpolated. So actually, you have been getting rescued, you are. Or in the Greek word, you are have been getting rescued. Those of you knowing Greek will realize what I am saying. The Greek literally reads like, you are having been getting rescued. To Paul, this is not a one-time event. Being rescued from judgment for sin is just the beginning of being rescued from sin. Deliverance is a divine activity and not simply a change of status. Note now some less important but significant renditions. I put loving kindness instead of grace. Loving kindness instead of grace. Because coming from a Calvinist background, grace is a poisoned word. And likewise, I imagine for a Lutheran or Catholic, it is also a poisoned word. In Hebrew, the word would be hesed. Hesed. Grace is a substance channeled by rituals or doctrine in Catholicism and Protestantism. Because the Father is represented in these denominations as needing appeasement. Okay. I avoided the word saved for similar reasons. Saved. We use the word rescued instead. Saved is a theological status, decided in eternity and irrevocable in Protestant theology, especially the Reformed version. Getting rescued is a divine activity that can be repeated because people can indeed return to sin and recover and get forgiveness again. Okay, that covers the mechanics of this passage. The rest is theology, or I should say, demolishing mainstream Christian theology and explaining what the truth is. The reader will see I made no significant changes in the end of verse 8 or verse 9. The problem here is not the translations. It is the Torah denier explanation. Faithfulness, or a pledge of faithfulness, is going to involve works, or doing the right thing and repenting from sin. If works means obeying the commandments, then both faithfulness without works and faithfulness alone, meaning the same thing, are oxymoronic statements. You can't have faithfulness without obedience. Even a mere pledge of faithfulness would be insincere and a lie if the penitent man did not mean it and start to obey Messiah. So what does Paul mean? Paul meant something other than obeying the law by works, as I will explain shortly. The church's solution I should mention first, and you will appreciate the real solution all the better. First is to shorten the word faithfulness down to faith so that the nuance of the word shifts to trust, or more crudely, just belief. Since this is still a work, if it is human-produced, the next step is to make the faith, quote-unquote, a gift of God. That is, it is said to be predestined in the eternal will of God. So by this strategy, the theologians manage to eliminate all human effort or works and a person knows they are one of the predestined, if they believe. And the believing is predestined too. Of course, this raises the problem of evanescent belief. A person subjectively is convinced he or she believes, but isn't really predestined. So now, let's drive toward a real solution here. As soon as I say that faithfulness involves real obedience and requires human cooperation, with divine rescuing, the Torah denier will lodge the accusation, saved by grace but kept by works. This is, in a sense, true. They are just wrong to object to it, as we shall see. 
When Paul says, not from works, does he contradict the required loyal obedience? Not at all. But by works, he means a well-defined class of works in Jewish theology. Certain deeds above and beyond the baseline requirements of the law were regarded as extra merit. What does extra merit mean? Normally, merit is its own reward, but in the case of supererogatory merit, that is, merit said to be above and beyond the call of duty, these merits Jewish theology taught, and still does, could motivate the Most High to benefit the performer of the deed by overlooking the doer's demerit on account of the merit. The works Paul speaks of are these kind of merits, which are a form of Jewish forgiveness. And just to make this plain, if one did not have enough merit of their own, one inherited merit from Abraham, if one was Jewish, which then gained divine favor despite one's demerits. This principle is implicit in Judaism's theology but the rabbis do not like to crassly state it. Anyway, it should be laid bare by so stating it. These merits are performed with a view to getting the demerits canceled. This is not real forgiveness. It is an indulgence, a payment for forgiveness. So when Paul said, not from works, he meant the theology of meritorious works he learned in Judaism. He did not mean faithful obedience. Faithful obedience certainly gives the faithful one an increased assurance that his or her sins are getting forgiven. No one should be ashamed of this. But our righteousness is not paying for forgiveness. There is no sin debt to pay for. The sin debt can only be forgiven. The Almighty gains nothing by applying deeds to debt. So to sum things up, we have been getting delivered by Yah's loving kindness through our pledge of faithfulness to Messiah Yeshua. The Most High is not demanding payment for sin in the currency of works. He is forgiving sin. And just so that you will know that I am correct about this, it is the Torah deniers who have changed the meaning of Messiah's death into a payment for sin and Messiah's righteousness into a legal exchange for sin. Satan always was a liar, wasn't he? But Messiah's death sums up the great cost which the Most High endurates. Note that, cost to the Most High versus the Most High paying himself. That is a huge 180 degree diametrically different difference. But Messiah's death sums up the great cost which the Most High endured. Messiah isn't paying the Father righteousness so that he will show us favor. He is showing what sin costs himself while he is holding out his hands waiting for us to repent and get forgiveness. So Torah denying Christian theology teaches salvation by works. Just as surely as Judaism teaches the merit of Abraham is imputed to the children. No one truly knows the Most High until he knows that he forgives without debt collection in any form.